Hey, we've got folks from all over. That's really exciting. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, whether it be evening, morning, in between. Um, my name is Kendra. I'm from the Japan Society of Northern California. And if you don't know about us, we are a nonprofit organization that's been around since 1905. And our main goal is to promote connection between Japan and the US. So the main ways that we do that are through different programs that we hold every month, um, just like the one today. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to one of our wonderful board members, Mr. Steve Pollack. So please take it away, Mr. Pollack. Thank you, Kendra, and welcome everybody to the Japan Society of Northern California program, Bundraku and Beyond, the Evolving Tradition of Japanese Puppet Theater. I'm very excited tonight to introduce Professor Martin Holman, who will lead our program today. Uh, Martin Holman is one of the foremost Western authorities on Bundaku, a Japanese theater art whose roots date back to the 15th century. He is also the first non-Japanese to perform Bundaku theater in Japan. He currently resides in the city of Tokushima in Shikoku, Japan, where he founded and leads the Tokubeza puppet troupe. Uh, in preparing for today's talk, I asked Martin a little bit about his background, and he grew up in Kentucky, so I wondered how he had become a world expert on, on Japanese puppet theater. He explained that he, even as a small child, he had been very interested in puppets and asked for a puppet from Santa as a four-year-old. Uh, but it was not until his junior year in college when he took a course on world puppetry uh, at Indiana University and uh, first uh, came to know about Japanese puppets. And he said it was, a, he thought it was one of the coolest things he had ever seen. And so, uh, based on that experience in his course, he spent some time in Japan between his junior and senior year and uh, switched his major from biology to uh, Japanese and continued his, uh, his pursuit of understanding about Japanese uh, culture and Japanese puppets. Uh, he, uh, he ultimately moved to Japan and in 1993, while living in Kyoto, he asked uh, a nearby uh, puppet theater, the Tonda Puppet Theater, and asked if he could be trained in the art of bunraku uh, puppetry. He then pursued his passion uh, uh, in Japanese uh, literature and arts at the University of California at Berkeley, and um, and then uh, uh, continued to uh, uh, pursue his passion after that. He has been instrumental in introducing Japanese puppet theater to international audiences, and has shared his love of bunraku by bringing hundreds of students to Japan for puppetry training programs and founding several different puppet troops in the U.S. and Japan. He continues to be an active participant in the theater's history and evolution through his work as director of the Awajirobe Yashiki Bundaku Museum in Tokushima and his leadership of the Tokubeza troupe and his work adapting traditional and modern materials for the puppet theater. Please join me in welcoming Professor Martin Holman to our program today. And if you have questions during his talk, please post them in the chat and we will have a Q&A session with uh, Professor Holman uh, after he, he completes his presentation. Thank you, and I uh, look forward to hearing your presentation, uh, Professor Holman. Thank you so much. Well, um, everyone, welcome to Tokushima. We're just southwest uh, on the island of Shikoku, southwest of Osaka and Kobe area. And uh, I'm coming to you from the Awajurobe Yashiki Puppet Theater and Museum. Uh, I'm not the director of the theater and museum. Uh, He's over here to the side who's uh, working on the uh, screen share when we get to that portion. And uh, his name is uh, Sato Kenji. And uh, he has been very helpful with me after I moved here to Tokushima in starting my puppet troupe here and uh, developing, well, I've been translating materials here uh, into English and my own puppet troupe has been uh, rehearsing and performing here at the theater. So. Um, I've lived in Japan about 15 years over the past 43. And uh, uh, as Steve said in the introduction, I've been uh, interested in puppets since I was a very small child. And then uh, finally in my in university years, I uh, was able to see Japanese puppetry and eventually come to Japan. I've lived here off and on uh, three and four year uh, two and three and four year stints at a time. Anyway, today I'd like to just jump right in here and start talking about uh, the puppets. Uh, first, just a little bit of history. The traditional puppet theater as you know it, as we see it now, which has 
three puppeteers operating a puppet that's anywhere from three to four and a half feet tall, uh, dates really from the 1700s. Before that, the puppets were smaller and uh, the, it's really hard to figure out the, the origins of the puppet theater because it was um, an itinerant, an itinerant sort of a tradition. Uh, people went from village to village performing with small puppets that they could carry on their backs. And there is still uh, a little bit of that left today in what is called the Hakumoashi. But just to start with, um, if we can go back in Japanese history, the Heian period, the golden age of the imperial court uh, ended in the late um, 12th century. And uh, there were clans then that were rivals for power, the Taira, and the, uh, the Taira and the Minamoto, the Heike and the Genji. And there were battles fought at the end of the 12th century. And those battles became the source of a lot of Japan's most important sort of history and legends and stories of valor and stories of, of uh, well, romance and revenge and, and such. And those stories, uh, came to be told by itinerant minstrels, sort of minstrels. Uh, they would play the biwa, which is a sort of a pear-shaped instrument known as the pipa in Chinese. And uh, they would play that and also then sing the stories. They would sing the narration and also do the voices of characters as well. And eventually those, those uh, men, as they performed, decided to, you know, up the ante a little bit by adding puppets to the performance. This is on, this is early in the uh, 13th, 14th centuries and 15th centuries. And so the puppet theater actually starts from an oral storytelling background. The puppets then were added to illustrate the story uh, because, you know, if you're a theater or more movies for that matter you know you want something with more impact to attract bigger crowds ultimately to make a living and so the puppets were added sometime in the uh, 14th 15th centuries but this was still an itinerant tradition because Japan was at war most of the time and it was impossible to like build a theater and expect to make money off of it because the next marauding army coming through would burn it down. It wasn't until, six, the six, uh, until 1600 when Japan was unified under the Tokugawa uh, regime that Japan became peaceful and it was possible to make money investments to manufacture things and to have a, an economy that allowed for, for trade throughout the country without fears of, a, you know, of another battle destroying everything you had put together. And so theaters began to be built, uh, commercial theaters in Osaka, in uh, what at the time was Edo, Tokyo. But then also this, this um, prosperity that came with the Edo period spread throughout the country. And there were small theaters built all over in very, very rural areas. If I can, um, here in, uh, Tokushima alone, there are still 80 of these rural dedicated puppet performance stages that are still standing here in Tokushima and many of them are used for performances. Now, if I can start uh, talking about Tokushima itself, the uh, Tokushima uh, actually has more puppet theaters, puppet troops than any other prefecture in Japan. There are more than 20 that are active today. In the past, there were over 100. Um, in most, the rest of Japan, the most you can find in any prefecture that are active is four or five or so. And many of those perform only once or twice a year. Here in Tokushima at the Awajurobe Yashiki Museum and Theater, which is a prefectural entity, we have performances every day, twice a day. And so, uh, and more for special events and such. And so this is one of the areas where the puppet theater really sort of originated as uh, an art form, although originally as out of religious ritual, um, out, as, out of, as a sort of rustic farm entertainment, then became more sophisticated. But it's in Osaka that the puppet theater became really a large, um, 
formidable kind of uh, force in Japanese arts. Now, first I should talk about the word bundaku. Now I hang dangle the word bundaku out there because that's the word that everyone seems to know. Even in Japan, um, there's a misunderstanding of what bundaku is. The word bundaku itself is, is only about 150 years old. Um, it's the name, it came from the name of one of the theaters in Osaka that became very, very popular. So it's like calling a refrigerator a frigidaire. Uh, the, the generic term is ningyo joruri. And when I say that, you realize why that word doesn't, isn't as popular as bundaku because of the, it's harder to say. Anyway, so ningyo joruri, puppet narration storytelling, is the generic word for the puppet theater. Bunaku is the Osaka form of ningyo joruri. And so uh, I prefer to, in English, to say traditional Japanese puppet theater, and of which bundaku is one subset, although it's the best known. Uh, <clears throat> so, so if you call a refrigerator a frigidaire, uh, then you can go ahead and call this bundaku, but it's actually uh, ningyo joruri. And uh, the form is mostly the same. The three man operation, and at the originally it was male, although there are uh, most many female, uh, many women who are puppeteers now um, in Osaka was very influential on the theaters throughout the country, but that influence went back and forth and uh, things that were originated in Osaka uh, techniques uh, and plays that were written there spread throughout the country and so the puppet head making itself, though, uh, has for the most part been centered in Tokushima. Here we have uh, about 40 people in, um, who are head makers here in Tokushima and almost all of the heads that are used, the puppet heads that are used in Osaka were carved here in Tokushima and continue to be today. So um, I'd like to just start out by showing you that uh, this is all so compressed doing all of this in 45 minutes. Uh, uh, go to Wikipedia, you can read something there and on Bundaku and do a little extra research afterwards. But first I'd like to show you what one of the puppets looks like now. Originally the puppets were short, only about this tall with a rod to operate the puppet with one puppeteer operating each puppet. Remember this goes back to the 13th, 14th, 15th century when this was a, when these puppeteers were traveling town to town, you needed smaller puppets, you had smaller audiences who could see a small puppet easily uh, from the closer distance. But now, uh, but then as this became a commercial theater, and as audiences grew larger, the puppeteers got, uh, the puppets got larger, puppeteers probably stayed about the same. Um, the puppets got larger, and eventually, instead of having one person operate the puppet, you, would ha you had three. And then that three-man operation, which dates from the middle of the 1700s, spread throughout Japan. And now that's really the standard um, sort of technique for operating traditional Japanese puppets. And um, so today, I brought in here a puppet body. Maybe we should have done this on, in, you know, on Halloween. And I'm going to go ahead and attach a random head here that I happen to have. Uh, now I should have, I should have practiced this before, I, before we did this, but the puppet head fits on here. And I hold this the puppet head here fits onto this wooden board. This is lufa, the uh, hechima, the uh, sponge, vegetable sponge that's used to shape the shoulders. And there's a hoop here that forms the waist, the, the uh, wooden board that forms the shoulders. And I reach in under here to hold the, to hold the puppet's head and operate it. And I use my right hand to operate the puppet's right hand here. 
We have a second puppeteer. We'll have a demonstration, a full demonstration here in just a few minutes. But then the left hand operator operates the left hand. You'll see that the upper part of the arm is just string. And so it's just the lower part of the arm and hand that are carved wood. Uh, these are all carved wood. And uh, this one has a longer rod so that the left-hand puppeteer doesn't have to be too close in. And then we have the legs here at the bottom. They are hang from this waist circle or from the shoulder board usually uh, in my experience. And then the puppet's leg is operated here like this with this handle. Sometimes the puppeteer simply grabs the calf to operate the puppet's leg. And so this is how the puppets are constructed. A lot of people are sort of surprised that it's mostly air, it's mostly space. There's, um, it's only the parts that protrude from the, from the uh, costume that actually are seen, uh, that are actually made of something solid. Uh, the center, you can see my hand inside, the, the torso is empty basically. So it's just the basic outlines that will hold the puppet's shape that, um, that make up the puppet. Uh, hand off my... And uh, so I'd like to, before I... Uh, before I, I'm going to switch over here and talk a little bit about um, the puppet heads and the carving of the puppet heads. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to have uh, three puppeteers from the Jurobeza, which is one of the 20 or so puppet theaters here in Tokushima. They perform quite frequently here. And uh, they're, going to, they're going to come out and with, um, two puppets and actually they'll be costumed. I'm wearing the black robes that one wears as a uh, puppeteer. I decided to wear that today. It's very slimming. Uh, and so they're coming out here in just a second. The troop's name is Juro Beza and uh, the uh, head of the troop is Kono-san. And then also Miyoshi-san will be performing and Kawamata-san. And so they'll be in here in just a moment. Dozo. Okay, so, so this puppet is Otsuru, who is the daughter in the most famous play that's performed everywhere in Japan these days. Um, it's really the most, it's performed more frequently than any other uh, puppet piece. It's part of a much longer play, but the main character, uh, the mother and the daughter and the husband who doesn't appear in this scene are actually, the characters are supposed to be from Tokushima, Bando Jurobe, but that is a real historic, he is a real historical figure, but 70 years after his death, this play was written and it ties in Tokushima, but historically what happens in the play has actually nothing to do with Bando Jurobe himself. But this is the daughter. And in this play, Ban Jurobe was, um, went to Osaka, his master's uh, heirloom sword was stolen <coughs> excuse me, was stolen, and Jurobe has gone to Osaka to find it. This is his, you know, sworn mission. And he goes basically undercover, uh, you know, goes uh, like an undercover cop, joining a band of thieves in order to be able to find the sword. Well, they left their daughter, Otsuru, behind in Tokushima, and Jurobe and his wife, Oyumi, went to Osaka then and they've been living this life here sort of undercover while he looks for the sword but he actually has sort of gone bad himself and uh, the authorities are on to him as a criminal and have delivered word that the, the, they, the, the authorities are coming and Ots Oyumi the mother finds out from one of her husband's accomplices that their lives are in danger, they may be arrested. 
at this, on this same day, the daughter that they had left behind uh, some eight or nine years earlier happens to come to their house, not knowing that this is the home of, their, of her mother and father. And um, so this is Otsuru, and she's on a pilgrimage among the 33 pilgrimage sites um, that are in the Kinki area in Osaka, Wakayama, Nara area. And so this is the puppet. So we'll, we, but now let's just talk about the puppet itself rather than the story. We'll get to that later. Okay, so um, Otsuru, we have the main operator is called the Omozukai. And yeah, uh, Omozukai no yaku wo chotto misete kudasai. Okay, so you can see that she has her arm here fit under the, the waist and is reaching inside to hold the, hold the, uh, the uh, shingushi roto. And then, so she can turn the head left and right and up and down. So no unazuki toka, ano sayu no ugoki. Yeah, and then with her own right hand, she has the puppet's right hand and she can open and close the fingers there. And then this fits in the sleeve. And so that is the omozukai, the main operator. Tsukai is to operate or manipulate a puppet. And then the left hand, hidari, <coughs> You can see that it has this uh, sashigane, this this um, rod, and then the fingers open and close with this movement right here, and then this uh, this is using the left hand. Left hand operator uses his or her own right hand to operate it, and so has this left hand free their own left hand free in order to handle any props or if something falls on the floor. And now, I know, just know, so. Hmm? Ah, yeah. So we're gonna have them come around here closer. The Ashizukai, the foot operator, then, and lift up here. You can see on a Yokoni stick. Hey, you can see that her her feet also san aruku sugato is like this. And then, so as you can see, all three puppeteers are hooded. Uh, the question will come up: Why are they hooded? I thought the main operator was supposed to be unhooded. That's only in Bunaku. The, uh, for the most part, puppeteers, the main operator, the foot operator, and the left-handed operator wear hoods. Um, the unhooded tradition is an Osaka bundaku tradition. Um, and it's also traditional in uh, religious ritual puppets to unhood the operators because it's not entertainment, it's a religious ritual. And so it's a different, it's a different critter. Okay, so... Uh, so she sit, can sit down and hello, Otsuru. And uh, what else? That's, <laughs> that's Otsuru, okay. Okay. So she's heading off and uh, her mother is going to come out here in just a moment, uh, Oyumi. So in this story, then, uh, if I we're, we're going to see a very short clip uh, in just a bit, but the uh, main operator, depending on their height, will wear these clogs, and uh, these are different sizes for different uh, puppeteers, depending on their own height, so that they can stand higher than the other two puppeteers, making it easier to actually operate uh, the puppet so that the left hand food operator can stay um,
I'm tall enough. I'm 182 centimeters, six foot. And I never wear these. One, I would have several broken legs if I ever did, but I'm usually tall enough to, to, to do the part without the, the geta. So this is Oyumi. Ohayou gozaimasu. So this is Oyumi. You can see her hands work. You can see her hands work the same way. The only difference here is that adult women never would show their feet during a performance. And so adult female puppets don't have feet or legs carved out of wood. Instead, the puppeteer holds the hems of the kimono to move the kimono as if it's as if there are feet underneath it's much more effective on stage than actually moving wooden feet that would never be seen so i'd like to uh, introduce dozo i'd like to introduce ano ii desu ka ano kuroko ano sono menpo wo chotto totte and see um miyoshi san <laughs> and uh, Kawamata san, and the uh, director of Jurobe, uh, Jurobe Za is uh, Kono san here. She actually lives right across the street from the theater. And so they came out early this morning in order to do this little demonstration for you. They actually are performing today. Uh, the puppet troops here in Tokushima uh, rotate and every day there are two performances at 11 and two o'clock more on special days. And so they are performing later today. So I got them here early so they could get, probably get too tired before the second show. Thank you so much. So that's uh, one of the puppets. And um, now I'd like to show you just a, a, a short clip from the play. I'm going to show you uh, the very beginning so you can see how the, the play starts. The curtain opens, there's an announcement and uh, the shamisen player and the taiyu who does the vocals then appear. And so, so we're going to see a, a clip from a, a performance that originated, that appeared, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a performance from April of last year. And uh, I'm not sure, we might actually be able to upload this, uh, the full play uh, so that people can watch it on YouTube, uh, but we're, we're working on that. We have to check out the uh, copyright issues. So the name of the play is Keisei Awa no Naruto, and the scene is Junde Utanodan, the, the, the scene of the pilgrim song. I don't know, we may have a, this may be glitching a little bit. You can see um, to your right, there's the Taiyu, the Gidayu, the narrator chanter and the Shamisen player. And they are wearing my favorite costumes. They have many different colors of this uh, Kamishimo, but uh, I love the green ones. And, uh, the narrator is uh, Naga, uh, Nagano Shiju, and who is uh, a relatively young um, Taiyu. And then uh, the shamisen player is uh, Takemoto Tomowaka, who is one of the absolute masters of both shamisen and is also a Taiyu, but in this case is uh, playing the shamisen. So, this is how the play starts. The shamisen player starts playing an introductory melody, and then the taiyu will start, uh, will start uh, doing the vocals. And uh, 
So Ma Martin, sorry, there's no sound coming up from your No sound? Computer. Okay. Yeah, so okay. maybe you can stop and then put in a um, okay. checkbox on the computer. Okay. Well, looks like we've got a little bit of a glitch there, but uh, I, I, uh, I am scarcely a master of Zoom. But anyway... So far, so good. It's perfect. It's, it's really <laughs> doing okay. No worries. Okay. So uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, we'll have to, we'll set the uh, video aside for now. And uh, I'll jump into some other areas. I wanted to show you the puppet heads because that's uh, one of the things that Tokushima is still known, is really known for. Uh, Oe Minosuke, uh, who is the, who carved almost most of the puppet heads that are still used right now in the uh, National Bundaku Theater in Osaka, uh, lived in, uh, here in Tokushima. And he died back in 1997 uh, at the age of about 90. His wife also was a puppet head carver and she died just a few years ago. And so many of the puppet head makers here in Tokushima uh, were trained by Oe Minosuke. Uh, before him was another puppeteer called Tengu Hisa. And uh, he also is, was, is quite famous for innovations. Uh, this, is a, this is a photograph of Oe Minosuke that actually Steve uh, uh, there with the Japan Society actually took this photo um, I didn't ask him, but he sent this to me yesterday and asked me if I knew who it was. And it is indeed Oe Minosuke, whom he met uh, in when he was a university student. So uh, this is him. Actually, someone actually carved a puppet of Oe Minosuke, which looks remarkably like him. But anyway, he is the really the most the premier puppet head maker of the 20th century. Uh, and was here in Tokushima. Uh, Amari Yoichiro, who is another Ningyo Yo, uh, is really sort of moved up into that stature of uh, being one of the premier puppet makers in the in the whole country. Uh, he carves heads for not just the Osaka Bunnaku Theater, but also all over the country. Uh, there are all kinds of puppet heads. Uh, this head is uh, actually carved by uh, a puppet head maker in, in uh, Nagano Prefecture in Ida. This is the character Ebisu. Um, some of you might recognize him from Ebisu Beer. Uh, he's also uh, one of the seven gods of good fortune that you sometimes see the lined up uh, in little statuary and things like that. And uh, I'll just show you up close. This is what the grip looks like or one of the ways. And he only has uh, two head functions. Now, all pup almost all puppets have this lever that lifts the head. So the default position, if I let go, his head falls forward. And then I lift the head here. And then Ebisu also has a mouth that moves and you can see here. And I use my thumb to pull this trigger and open his mouth. Now, Japanese puppeteers do not lip sync the vocals. The mouth movements are just used for things like laughing or smoking and blowing soap. And so, uh, oh, so he's, this is him. So he's one of my favorites. I, we, my own troupe, Tokubeza, performs uh, Ebisumai, the dance of Ebisu. And so he gets a lot of use uh, in my troupe. Then, uh, Another puppet head here. This was carved by a head maker in Awaji. This head uses a different kind of uh, mechanism for lifting it. Uh, it's a, a, a little ball of cloth that's wrapped up and then you just slip it between your fingers and lift the head this way, rather than having a mechanical lever. And uh, this puppet, is uh, San Baso, who is used in both religious ritual and an entertainment piece. 
that uh, in religious ritual, the Sambaso is performed to um, for um, rain, good, you know, plenty of rain, uh, abundant crops, the safety and you know, preservation of the nation and things like that. And, uh, but there's also a comic aspect to this character and he gets quite surprised and his face does this. And uh, so this is a uh, Sambaso puppet. There are, um, this is a young woman. Now she doesn't have any hair. Uh, she doesn't have her hair piece attached. So she, uh, she would probably, she's probably not liking this that I'm actually showing you what she looks like you know, without her wig on. But she also has the same mechanism here, a lever, and her eyes close. So, you know, she might, she might cry, and then she... ...comes up like this. So all of these heads are carved from wood. They take a solid block of wood. I'm, I didn't want to bring the whole block in here, but uh, in our museum here, we have a demonstration or we have a exhibit of this. This is what the head looks like when it's carved down in a rough way, smoothed out. It's then split in half and the mechanisms on the inside are installed. And this puppet has quite a few moving parts, both his mouth, his eyes, his eyebrows, and uh, these are then fitted back together again before it's glued together, covered uh, with uh, Japanese paper, and then painted with 20 to 30 layers of gofun, which is uh, a paint paste made from uh, fish glue and uh, ground up seashells to make the white, uh, if it's a another uh, sort of, red or flesh color or something like that, they'll add color to the paint. But this is what it looks like on the inside. And so we've got all of these strings that allow you the different, I'll, I'll pull these, and this is the spring right here. You pull that and I can show you then what happens on the, on the outside. These would not necessarily all be pulled at the same time, but this is, uh, this is how it would work. And you can see the eyes also going side to side. There are also some specialty heads. This is a woman who is possessed by jealousy and she looks like a lovely young lady, but uh, when her jealousy takes over and the serpent tooth of jealousy appears, she changes. And this character, this puppet is used for a character in uh, Hidakagao Iriai Zakura, uh, which uh, takes place at Dojoji Temple. Uh, the, this story about her has been, uh, has been done in no, in kabuki, in traditional puppet theater, and also in Japanese dance. So this is a uh, Kiyohime is the character that this head is used to play. It's called a gabu head, so. And uh, people sometimes don't realize how much comedy there is in the traditional puppet theater. But even in a fight, you can have uh, puppets that, uh, oh, wait, I gave it. That wasn't supposed to happen, okay? Uh, uh, the puppet is, uh, <laughs> okay, so. The puppet is a fight in a fight and he gets hit with a uh, sword and his head falls apart. And uh, so that's what happens actually physiologically when you are sliced in half from the top of the head. Anyway, uh, I'd like to show you some of the hands up close here. This is a left hand and you can see 
that uh, this is a, a, a male left hand. Uh, as you pull the strings here, the hand, the fingers extend. And you can also close the hand up like this. Uh, the right hand in this case is held by the puppeteer's right hand. The fingers extend like this. Okay. Um, I realize that this is sort of a scattershot presentation. We're all over the map here, but I've, you know, if I really gave this an honest sort of introduction, this would have to be about three hours long. And I don't know if all of you would have the patience for that. But what you should do is come here to Tokushima to see traditional Japanese puppet theater. It is the only place in the whole country and all of Japan where you can see puppet theater every single day of the year and with at least two performances. And uh, we are just, uh, this is my advertisement for Tokushima. We're actually very close to Kobe and Osaka. It's only less than an hour and a half by car from Kobe uh, over the longest suspension bridge in the world. And then the 15th longest suspension bridge from Kobe to Awaji Island, passing through Awaji Island and crossing the Naruto Straits, which is where the uh, whirlpools are. And then you're here in Tokushima. From Osaka, there's a bus every half hour, and it takes only about two hours to get here. Uh, anyway, the uh, uh, a little bit about what goes on here. We have uh, the puppet performances at the Awajurobe Yashiki Theater and Museum every day at two, 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Um, uh, all of these puppet troops uh, that perform here are all scattered around different parts of Tokushima Prefecture. My own troupe, um, I actually have two. In the United States, my troupe is, uh, which started in 2004. It, we called it Bundaku Bay Puppet Theater uh, and still is active, although as active as Corona has allowed us to be for the past uh, almost two years now. Uh, but still performing in the States and my troupe there is still active. And then here in uh, uh, Tokushima, I started the Tokubeza tradition puppet theater. And our troupe is made, our troupe here in Tokushima is made up of uh, Japanese people as well as, uh, here's my little advertising. Uh, 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 we have, members of, of our troop that are Japanese. Uh, I'm American. We have a Mexicans. We have Canadian from the UK, from New Zealand and Italy. And so we've got people from all over who are getting together to uh, promote traditional Japanese puppet theater. Uh, my, my desire as a, as a traditional Japanese puppeteer is to you know, protect and defend the tradition but part of the tradition is also innovation. And uh, so, you know, 300 years ago, there were no uh, three person puppets. They were all one person. At some point, the innovation to add two puppeteers to the one to make the three person operation was something that some people probably said, that's not traditional, you shouldn't be doing that. But that became then the standard and became the tradition. And so within the tradition, I think it's important that it not become uh, a stuffed museum piece. And I think many puppeteers here in Japan feel that way. And in fact, the National Theater in Osaka, the Bunaku Theater has been doing some new and different things. Uh, they even uh, had uh, uh, one of their characters eating a McDonald's hamburger uh, back in one of the pieces I saw, uh, and drinking their tea out of a uh, out of a liter and a half uh, plastic bottle, and uh, for a comic effect and such. And so here in uh, Tokushima, also we're doing the traditional pieces. We're also doing some newer pieces, or we're doing pieces that are traditional stories but have never been done in the puppet theater before. I'm working now on Casa Jizo, the story of an old man who, uh, who gives away his hats to the Jizo Buddhist statues because the snow is falling on their heads. And as a 
as an act of, uh, of kindness and compassion, he gives away the hats instead of selling them. And that's an old story that every Japanese person knows. And uh, I think it would, it's a wonderful story for the puppet theater. And so we're working on that. Other troops here are doing some new stories and old stories in, as puppet theater. And so um, I encourage you to come to Tokushima, see the whirlpool, see our Awa Odori Dance Festival, which draws over a million people to a city that only has 250,000. And uh, we're right here on the ocean. The mountains are right behind us. Uh, it's a beautiful place. And I hope that you'll come here and visit Tokushima and come see, the, come see what we have to offer here and come see the puppet theater. You can get, unlike the national theater, you can get up close. Uh, you can see the puppets, you can see, talk to the puppeteers and all. And so I would just encourage any of you to, I, I just cannot, encourage you enough to come visit Shikoku, which is also the home of the 88, pilgrim 88 Temple Pilgrimage. It starts in Tokushima and rotates around, uh, around Shikoku. Uh, I would encourage you to come here and enjoy that. Now, we're going to have a question and answer time now, and uh, I am looking forward to uh, answering your questions. Also, uh, if you would like to contact me directly, Tokubeza, the name of my truth, uh, at gmail.com. And so uh, if you're interested, uh, if you're coming this way, uh, I'd be happy to meet up with anyone. And also, um, if you are interested in seeing a performance in the United States or booking a performance, uh, Bunaku Bay Puppet Theater, it's Bunaku Bay at gmail.com or contact me at Tokubeza. And uh, we, we perform, uh, we, I'm not necessarily there, but uh, perform in the United States also. So I'm happy, uh, so happy to uh, uh, welcome all of you to Tokushima today, uh, virtually. And I hope that um, I'll, I'll be able to meet you in person and we can perform for you in person. And uh, so, uh, Great. I Let me, guess I'll uh, have to leave it here now and turn it over to Steve. The uh, Thank you, Marty. That was a fascinating uh, walk through the history of Bundaku, and I'm sure we all learned something from your presentation today. Uh, I'm going to start us off with a question um, and then move to some from the audience. But I'm curious, as a performer, what do you find the most difficult uh, part of performing in Bunraku? And what do you want us as an audience to appreciate when we attend a Bunraku uh, performance, other than just the, you know, the, uh, the essence of kind of the, the puppet uh, movements? What, what do you look for when you go to a performance? Well, of course, this, there's a story there. And part of the, the, the problem, you know, as a non if you don't speak Japanese, is actually understanding the story that's going on. Now, um, here at uh, Judo Bayashiki, we have uh, English translations of some of the plays so that uh, a non-Japanese can understand what's going on. I think if you understand, for example, the play that I wasn't able to show the clip, but the play with the mother and the daughter really is a story that I think most anyone can understand. If you don't have children of your own, at least you have parents and perhaps you can understand. So the sense of having to leave a daughter behind because of basically because of your work. And I think many people uh, uh, have felt the pangs that are involved with choosing between family and work, or maybe choosing incorrectly between family and work. Um, and so the, these are puppets. They're made out of wood. They're made out of bamboo and cloth. And I've always been, you know, sort of fascinated in the way that something so artificial can actually portray human emotion so effectively. And, um, and so some people are, uh, some people have trouble with the, the black hulking figures of the puppeteers, but, uh, you know, getting in the way, but usually you can get past that within the first few minutes of a performance and really focus on the puppets. I'm actually, uh, we're broadcasting here from the puppet stage, 
but we have we have uh, guests coming into the theater now. So I'm going to take this and move over to uh, the dressing room so that uh, to do my right. question and answers from here. Let me, um, and, let me actually uh, turn to some of our audience questions. And I think the first one up is Elizabeth, uh, I'm not sure, Ombrellaro, uh, are you available? And do you wanna ask your question of Marty? You have to turn your mute off. Okay, you. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Okay, Great. perfect. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I really thank enjoyed you. It. Uh, I was curious about how long women have been in the art form, and like, is there a specific gender split? Because I know it was predominantly a male art form. And then, well, my yes. follow-up question is, how many young people are getting into the art form? Oh, okay. Well, actually, the only puppet troupe in the whole country, and there are about 60 or 70 traditional puppet troops in Japan. Um, the only one that has no women is the National Bunaku Theater in Osaka. Uh, all the other troops have a lot of women. Many of them are majority women for that matter. And that's true with the shamisen players and the Taiyu vocalists as well. Um, there have been women Am I still on? Okay. Um, there have been women or female troops going back well over a hundred years. Um, it's really in the post-war period that it's become important to, uh, to uh, open it up to women. In, in many troops though, it wasn't just um, all men. It was only descendants of a few, you know, originating families of a given troop. And then in post-war with all of the movement, young, you know, young people used to all stay in the same village. And so you could pass things down father to son, but um, especially in the 20th century and especially post-war, people have become much more mobile in Japan. And so you really have to open it up to more people who want to do puppets uh, in order to actually keep it going. Uh, and so there were all female troops back in the 1800s as well. Uh, my own troop is about half and half. Uh, most of the troops here in Tokushima are majority women. And actually, uh, 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 Kanjiro-san, Kiritaku Kanjiro, the, uh, who is recently designated as a living national treasure in Bundaku. And so he's... He actually said, it's just a month or so ago, that uh, we're probably going to have, we're probably going to end up opening this to women as well. There's really not a good reason. And if someone brought a lawsuit, they're likely to win because, and here in Tokushima, uh, we have so many women performing both as puppeteers and as shamisen players and taiyu. Um, and we've had uh, female taiyu have been designated living national treasures as well, uh, not in the Osaka troop, but outside the Osaka troop. And so there's a recognition here generally that women do an amazing job just as well as any man. Uh, in fact, I think when it comes to doing, sometimes when I see a male, I shouldn't say this, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being broadcast, sometimes male Taiyu doing children's voices are creepy. I didn't say that. Don't tell anyone I said that. I <laughs> so anyway, uh, plenty of women. I would be. Ha I would love to see the you know uh, the national theater open up uh, to women puppeteers and shamisen players and taiyu. Uh, you know when that's going to happen, I'm not sure. But the rest of the puppet world in Japan has been welcoming women now for decades. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for a great question. Uh, we've had several questions about women uh, performers in, in Bundaku. Uh, let me turn to one, um, I don't know, is Odessa uh, on the call able to kind of ask your question about making puppets? Hi. I, Hi. Am I? Okay. Yes, go ahead so with your I question. I was wondering how long it takes to build the puppets. 
oh, okay. Um, the puppets, I mean, if you're going to sit down and just carve and carve and carve all the way through, um, I'm not sure because most puppeteers are doing part of the work, doing working on multiple puppet heads at a time. But when it's um, carved, we're talking weeks, a minimum a few weeks to carve a puppet and make it because you also have to paint it and let it dry, paint it again with like 20 or 30 layers of paint. And so you have to paint it, let it dry, paint it, let it dry. And so it generally takes at least a couple of months to make a puppet head, but that's not constant work all the way through. I know that's kind of a vague answer to the question, but uh, I, think you I don't had know. A, I think you had another question about animal puppets too, right, Odessa? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we have, there are animal puppets. Um, I don't have any with me right now, but in one of the shows that I did uh, this past year, a couple of times, we had a monkey puppet. So it's a carved, a carved head of a monkey. And so monkeys pop up in the, in the traditional Japanese puppet theater uh, a lot of times. And then there are also horses and um, also um, kitsune, uh, foxes. Foxes come up in, yeah. <laughs> Kitsune, uh, actually we might have one the fox is nearby so i'll uh, i'll show that so we'll go on we'll move on to the next question now and if the fox turns up here i'll show the uh no we can't do it the fox is all locked up it's locked up but they have fox uh fox puppets that pop up yeah and so i've seen the monkeys horses foxes um, sparrows, birds. I've seen some bird puppets too. And then I use a butterfly puppet, which is pretty simple. It's just paper on a stick uh, fluttering. So yeah, there are pup animal puppets. That's great. Yes. Um, so uh, one of the questions, given that we have a mixed audience of Japanese and uh, you know English speakers, uh, Lena Morita, are you on the call? Do you want to ask your question? Hi, I don't remember which question I asked, but um, I, this is such a great presentation. I love this. Thank you so much. Well, thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, my Japanese isn't so great. So I'm wondering, do you have uh, simultaneous translations of, of your plates? Wow. I know you well, said that you have some translations, we, but. Mm -hmm. Well, for the last, uh, about a year ago, I did subtitles for the play that we perform most frequently here, and so that they can be projected above the screen during performance. Now, for the past, since January of last year, we hardly have any non-Japanese visitors here to the theater, so we haven't put it in place yet. But the plan is that once Japan opens up to free travel and all, that we'll have uh, super titles projected for uh, Keisei Awa no Naruto, the play that um, is performed here every day. And so we'll have, uh, we, we will have uh, those super titles. At the National Theater in Osaka, um, they have uh, uh, ear set uh, and earphones that you can wear that provide like an English, uh, uh, like a simultaneous English feed, yes. sort of, oh, okay. of, of, of yeah, explanation of what's going on. Okay. But uh, that's one of the things I'm doing here at the theater is is translating written materials, printed materials into English. And then also I've been working on uh, subtitles, super, well, super titles for, for the plays that are performed regularly here. I've got the ones that are performed most frequently, I've got the super titles done. We just haven't got them ready to, to project yet. Oh, that's so exciting. I have one more question. Your, your yes. troop in the United States, do they ever come to California, specifically um, San Francisco? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We we are and we were and still are based in Missouri. Can I say something uh, harsh that without making Californians angry? <laughs> I don't know. No, go ahead. When Californians look to the east, first of all, maybe New York is worth worth some attention, but everything in between isn't. And I don't think anyone in San Francisco usually believes that there possibly be, could be 
traditional Japanese puppetry worth seeing that comes out of Missouri. <laughs> because we've performed at 30 in 34 states out, wow. of, out of the, you know, the United States, plus the Smithsonian Institution and the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in uh, DC. And we've been to most of those states multiple times performing. Um, so anyway, uh, the only time we went to California is we were invited uh, by uh, NBC Universal. Uh, there was a, a um, sitcom called Animal Practice that was set in a veterinary hospital. It only lasted for eight episodes, but uh, they were looking for a puppeteer, uh, you know, a puppet troupe that had a gabu head, the kind with the horns coming out. And, uh, and it was, uh, yeah. Gabu Well, Marty, how about this? Okay. If you, anyway, if you... so they uh, so they uh, finally contacted me because someone in California knew about us, and they said uh, uh, they said we didn't think that you would have anything like that. So we ended up. My daughter and I flew out to uh, to uh, Universal uh, and filmed the. Uh, it was only a 30 minute segment as part of the story. And so we, we uh, had our gabu head, but I guess they were searching all over California and just couldn't imagine that there, if it wasn't in California, it couldn't be anywhere else. <laughs> so. Well, how about this, Marty? If you come out, you have to come to the Japan Society of Northern California and give a performance. Well, yes. I would, we would love to, we would love to. We, uh, we, we, you know, we've been to Oregon and Washington and, you know, we've been to, uh, haven't been to Nevada, been in Utah and Texas and, and all. And so, uh, no, we would love to come, especially since it's my old stomping ground because I was at Cal Berkeley sure. uh, and I was a tour guide in San Francisco, a bilingual tour guide for a while with Great. dolphin tours in San Francisco. So, uh, no, me, we uh, would let... love, to, love to come in performance at uh, Japan Society. Let me turn to another question because uh, we've got quite a few that have piled up. Uh, Neil, do you want to ask your question? Hey there. Um, first of all, fantastic uh, session. This I've, I've, I've only seen no previously. Um, mm -hmm. And Bunraku, I was kind of hoping I could see bits and pieces of the play, but you know, I'll have to do my own research. But it's nice to meet you, Mr. Holman. Uh, this was a fantastic talk. My question is, where are you located? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm from uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Oh, great. Uh huh. Okay. Um, this is actually a uh, college assignment, but you know, I'm I'm doing this for fun too. But long story short, how does Bunraku compare in uh, popularity to No and uh, Kabuki? Well, all three of them, uh, they don't have huge followings. But then again, in the United States, who watches opera, right? It's yeah. still a rel you know, live, a relatively small uh, portion of the population. One of the things about the, the puppet theater and uh, the puppet theater is it takes three people to operate one puppet. If you've got two characters, it's six, three characters, it's nine. Plus you have to have the shamisen and the vocalists and all that. And those, and you have to have a puppet. And after I, when I trained as a puppeteer back almost 30 years ago, for the first years, I didn't have my own puppet. I didn't have access to one. I couldn't afford to buy one and all. And now I have about 30 puppets that I've collected over the years to perform with. But one of the problem limiting factors is the number of people it requires to do a performance. And, uh, and so, you know, so if you're looking like in the United States, like I was talking about traditional arts like opera, you know, it's actually a relatively small number of, you know, segment of the population mm -hmm. that is interested and watches it. And some people are just sort of like, hear it off to the side in their lives, but it never actually, you know, sort of delve into it. Um, the puppet theater is performed in fewer places, I think, than Kabuki. Now, no, um, has a, a, real, a relatively limited number of places where it's performed. Um, we're still talking about a traditional, you know, art form um, that, you know, real aficionados will go see it. And some people will go see it for its uh, sort of like, oh, that would be an interesting cultural experience to do that. And so, 
you know, I hate to talk it down, mm -hmm. but, you know, traditional puppet theater, Kabuki and No don't have mass huge followings. Although most everyone in Japan has seen it either on television, on film, if they haven't seen it live. And that's true with Kabuki and, and No and uh, the traditional puppet theater, Bundaku or whatever uh, as well. So, you know, how can I say this without, <laughs> without telling you that I, you know, I work in a field that's just tiny. Well, everyone knows what it is. And the people who actually go see it and go see good performances of it tend to really enjoy it. Would you say popularity is increasing a little bit more, you know, with time or is it still? Oh, yeah, I think it is. I think okay. it is. There was a real, there was a real dip in the 60s and 70s. And then it's been increasing since then. You know, we have 20 troops active here in Tokushima. Uh, 12 of them perform every month here, at least one, two, three times a month here at the Judo Bayashiki Theater. So, uh, uh, and I just overall, it seems like the, the interest and the number of performances that are given and, uh, you know, monthly, if you look across the country, has been growing since the mm. 70s. But there was a real dip post-war. Um, Pre-war, there were hundreds and hundreds of traditional puppet theaters around the country, but the war did a number on a lot of of the continuation of, of, of traditional activities in Japan. And particularly puppets that require so many physical objects to actually do the theater. If you've got, for no drama, you know, if worse comes to worse, you can perform it, put a mask on and one actor can do it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you have the music and everything. Kabuki, you know, just requires a single actor to do a single part. and you, Multiple parts is only one person per part. Puppets, that's three, um, you know, that's three people for one puppet. And so that's been one of the limiting factors in the traditional puppet theater. This is Marty, we have, a, we have another oh. question. Can I ask, um, uh, yes. can I ask Catherine Ed to uh, ask your question? There we go. Holman Sensei, arigatou gozaimasu. First of all, I want to shout out to my fellow student, Neil Sharma, also here at UNC. Hi, Neil. Hope the midterm went well today. And Homan Sensei, um, um, when I told my eight-year-old grandson what I was going to do tonight, he asked me the following. He said, do they ever have special effects like snow or rain isn't that great isn't that a great question yes 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 we do in fact ah, for, i was talking about i was talking about casa Gizo, in that Gizo. it snows and and we use the we use a snow cradle uh you know just like the western theater does <laughs> and uh, so we have snow rain is a little harder to do you know effectively yeah. snow works great uh, in fact traditionally one way of doing snow was you had a basket with cut paper in it and someone in a long black bamboo pole and the person would be hooded. Uh, I don't have a hood here. Oh, okay. Would, have, would be would hooded and one person would stand on stage shaking the bamboo <laughs> pole. That was my job one time. Uh, and we performed a piece called Yaoyo Oshichi. Uh, 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 hidaka ga, not Hidaka, it's uh, Date Musume Koi no he got no pole where she climbs the fire tower. And if you look online, you'll actually be able to find that one on YouTube because there are a lot of people who have shot that one from the audience at uh, Gion Corner in Kyoto. And it's she funny, climbs funny, the funny, fire yeah. tower in the winter Pardon? and there's snow, there's snow falling. And so um, there's also rivers there. I've seen rivers done like a waterfall with rollers, like big rollers that are about this big and they're rolling a, a series of rollers going down in a slope. And, and as they turn, it's supposed to look like water falling. Oh, and uh, wow. lots of other things. Just uh, this summer, I saw Shitakiri Suzume, which is the tongue cut Spiro, a traditional Japanese folk tale done at the National Theater. And the puppeteers who operated the sparrows, the birds, were actually, they'd fly them 
and they came down from above. And so the puppeteer's all in black operating the, the bird, the bird puppet, and they, they're flying. And then at the end, they took off and floated in the sky as the curtain closed. Oh. So yes, there are, and I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, a play where the puppet ended up flying over the audience and then into a, a door in the in the back wall of the theater, but flew over the audience the whole way. So the National Theater and the National Theater has a big theater with lots of technical stuff and does that. Uh, <coughs> here, um, we I've already been talking with uh, Iwasa-san, who is our theater tech guy who set up all this stuff today and about uh, doing uh, uh, doing some special effects involving snow and involving one of the gods falling from the clouds in the in the Kyogen piece, Kaminari. And um, uh, so, oh, here, here we've got uh, a photograph of, uh, of, a, of a piece with snow here. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, Homan Sensei, thank you so much. Arigato gozaimasu. Oh, it's my pleasure, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Great, thank you for your question, Catherine. I, I think we're coming up to the end, but I uh, saw a question from Alex Levin. Do you want to ask your question about funding? Get this unmuted. Martin, Hi, Alex. how are you doing? Good. I'm fine. Good morning. Thank you. I've been involved in some way with puppetry for way too many years. Back in the old days when I had dark hair and was very young, saw Boon Raku performed at a stage in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful. Now, again, being from the arts, I always think about funding also, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The reality oh. being here in the States, there ain't none. Right. Uh, unless you work very hard for it and get very lucky at times. <laughs> How is it uh -huh. set up in your areas where is it government funded, co-funded, strictly tickets? Um, here, um, the troops here in Tokushima are all uh, basically uh, amateur. In fact, there are only two professional puppet, traditional puppet theaters in Japan. That's the National Theater in Osaka and the Awaji Theater, which is actually just 10 miles that way <laughs> across the bridge over on Awaji Island. Those are the only two tr uh, professional uh, theaters in Japan. But um, so all the troops that are active throughout the country today are amateur troops. Now we'll perform sometimes and get a, a ore, you know, a, an honorarium for a performance and things like that. But then once you split those honor, the, that honoraria, that honorarium among, you know, seven to ten people who are performing, it doesn't really feel like a very professional kind of situation. Uh, so. Uh, really, we're on our own here. We're no co no for the co most part. Uh, no no kind just of corporate sponsorships, things like that. No, I mean there are some troops have a little bit of uh, government funding mm -hmm. and all, but it usually goes to pay for things like uh, you know materials and such. And you know, then the troops that perform, if we go out to perform somewhere, we'll you know get a little bit of money, but it really doesn't. It doesn't feel like a, an income, a salary, or you know, it keeps, anything. It keeps just the a, lights on, but not the heat. <laughs> right, 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 right. And you know, here, you know, my troop, you know, we've performed and, and received an honorarium, but once you split it among us, you know, we it doesn't really cover the taxis and gas hardly. Well, thank but you. But that's true, the and even in 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 Japan. The traditional, the puppet theater outside of the major cities has generally been an amateur um, activity. Although some of the best troops scattered out around the country in rural areas um, have gone back in the 1800s and before the before World War II mm -hmm. would travel town to town and and uh, make a little bit of money. But um, it really hasn't. It that doesn't happen much anymore. Well, thank you and the folks in San Francisco for sharing this because I know from European, I know from a little bit of Asian, from Japanese, this was an education. Thank you. 
rescue. And uh, a, a number of the troops, as I said, get a little bit of funding from their municipal governments and prefectural governments and such to kind of maintain things. Uh, but yeah, nobody's getting rich off of this. <laughs> and where are you located? Oh, I'm um, in Tampa nowadays, but we've lived okay. all over the country. I, I actually had the honor, the pleasure of working on the first Muppet film in California that many years ago. Oh, but okay. The troops across the states. And again, I'm not rich. <laughs> <laughs> no. Great. Well, thank you so much. Great. Well, I think that we are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Miho, but I think we're coming to the end of the time that we had asked people and uh, asked Marty to be available. Very much um, so. <laughs> yes. Well, I encourage if, if you, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, uh, the name of my trope, tokubeza at gmail.com will get it to me and or uh, Bunaku Bay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think these uh, are the names of my two troops. Also, we're on Facebook. You can uh, friend us on Facebook and follow our activities here. Both I have Facebook pages for Tokubeza and for Bundaku Bay. So uh, you know, stay in touch. I I love to stay in touch with people who are interested in well, the same, same things I am. So. Well, Marty, looking at the uh, comments flowing in, I would say that you have uh, a lot of fans in the audience and uh, encourage uh, even people uh, wondering how they can follow in your footsteps in pursuing a career in, uh, in Japanese puppetry. But uh, Well, we actually are looking at starting a training program here uh, for both Japanese and non-Japanese to come in for the summer for anywhere six weeks to eight weeks or something like that to do a special intensive training uh, for puppetry. So if you, um, if you like my Tokubeza page on Facebook, um, then I'm sure we'll be announcing it on that. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do it, to do it next summer because uh, who knows about travel, but uh, that's a project we're working on here of people can come into Tokushima, train in the puppet theater, also do things like taiko drumming, uh, uh, playing the koto, other kinds of cultural activities along with the puppet theater. I did programs like that every summer for many years uh, when I was at the University of Missouri and before that at the University of Massachusetts and that Maria College, where I was before. Um, there's also another troop here. The troop I originally trained with has done summer programs before. I don't know if those who are ever going to are going to restart or not. But get in touch with me because we will. We may be doing a training program here in Tokushima. Great, well, I, um, I will uh, take this moment to, uh, on behalf of everybody here, to thank you for. Uh, putting together a fascinating lecture and sharing your story and uh, collection of um, artifacts as well and giving us a lot of insight into something I'm sure all of us would like to learn more about and uh, I think with that I'll turn it back over to Takahide Akiyama from the Japan Society to uh, make some closing remarks and then um, I don't know if, if you're available to uh, stay online for a few more minutes but sometimes we do have a little extra session for people who want to continue the conversation after uh, the formal close of the program. So with that, let me turn it back over to Takahide and well, thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Well, I'm, uh, I'm free here now. I don't have, I, <laughs> I don't have anything uh, coming up right after this. And I don't think this room needs to be used to the troupe that's performing is in the green room next door. And so uh, as long as I have battery power here, uh, I think I'll be able to uh, stay on and answer any questions. And, Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. And I want to express my thanks to Japan Society of Northern California. This was an absolute, this has been an absolute delight. Although I was nervous. Oh. I, and I don't do Zoom very often. I certainly don't do Zoom where everyone's watching me. And so uh, mostly I was worried about the technical aspects going well and also having to worry about staying in frame when I show people things and all that. But uh, this has been an absolute delight. And I want to thank the Japan Society of Northern California for giving me this opportunity to share something that's been important to me since puppets have been important to me since I was at least four years old. And uh, especially now Japan has been my life for the last 43 years, uh, 15, 16 years living here. 
and uh, thank you, thank you so much for the work you do to uh, spread knowledge of Japan um, to uh, Northern California and far beyond. Great. Well, thank you, Takahide. Thank you. I was on mute. Well, thank you. Thank you, Martin and Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. And it uh, looks like everyone has uh, greatly enjoyed it. It's been fascinating one hour, a little bit more, uh, to learn many things about uh, Bundaku or Ningyo Jorori. We will also learn the difference between, you know, strictly speaking, Bundaku and uh, Ningyo Jorori. <laughs> oh, uh, no, Akiyama-san. Yes. Can I just before he's gone? Yes. Sato san. Yes. I was going to oh, say okay. thank you very much, uh, Sato san, too. I, I'm yes. here. Yes. Oh, you're here. There he is. Yes. Uh, okay. This is uh, uh, Sato Kenji san, who is the Kancho, the uh, yes. director of the Jurobe Yashiki Puppet uh, Theater and Museum. And he's yes. made all this happen. He's He's the one who makes puppet theater happen throughout Tokushima Prefecture. And I just wanted everyone to get a, sure. a, a look at him. Wow, Martin, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Sato-san, allowing the, uh, this event you. to happen. And then, just want to also, everyone keep, if you can join me uh, thanking to, uh, to him uh, and I the, hope many American people come to our theater. Oh. Hi. Thank Definitely. you very much today. And so you, you don't see... have you don't have to be American to come. So we'll take the <laughs> Brazilians and the Brits and the Aussies. Okay. Uh, That'd be great. Yes. And this uh, is uh, Iwasa san, of course. <laughs> who is the our theater tech guy here who uh, who makes everything physically work here at the theater. Arigato. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. So all you know, the people in the audience, uh, when you visit, you will already know, of course, Martin, Sato-san, and all other stuff at the museum. Anyway, well, I just wanted to thank you again for everyone uh, joining today's event. It's been just fascinating. And thank you very much, uh, Martin, for your thank very you. detailed, detailed explanation and demonstration about the Ningyo Joruri or Abundaku. I must say, I must say that we are very fortunate to, to have you as a very unique Bundaku uh, expert, performer, and teacher, and puppet, puppetry troupe owner, and many things. Um, also, we have so many attendants that I think uh, it reflects how much Japanese traditional arts, like Ningyo Joruri or Bundaku, are very popular. We talked about you know popularity, but it seems to be coming back and still attracts a lot of people from the world over. You know, we just had many people, not just from Northern California, but across the country in the US and from Europe, UK, Greece, and Southern uh, South America also. So it's wonderful. You may know um, we started Japan Society of Northern California last year, started a series called Traditional Art in Modern Japan. And I've had, a, in addition to today's Bundaku event, we had the Kabuki and No event earlier this year. And this is the third one this year. So we will continue this series. And if you have any idea or anything you would like us to consider to do, just please let us know. Steve, thank you for your, the opening of the event and also fascinate, uh, facilitating uh, Q&A session. And thank you also uh, all the people attending for your active participation by asking many questions. I know there are many more uh, questions in waiting. Um, Japan Society of Northern California is a 116 year old organization. And we are committed to advance understanding and friendship between the US and Japan. We will continue to provide interesting and meaningful events like this one throughout the year, both in culture and art and history on one hand and technology innovation and business on the other. Our activities uh, and uh, events like this have been made possible with the general support from many corporate and individual uh, members. In particular, I would like to recognize and thank MUFG Union Bank 
our strategic partner, ANA, Dodgen Cox, Japan Airlines, Megagon Labs, United Airlines, as the Yokozuna uh, members. Uh, I hope you are seeing other members, uh, members, uh, corporate members of our, of our society. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank you for your donations for this event and for the society. Your kind support means a lot to us. Thank you very much. Next Monday, uh, which is uh, September the 27th uh, or 28th in Japan, we'll be hearing an interesting story of Adobe, which is a leading Silicon Valley company with products such as Photoshop, PDF, and so on. And they are front runner in business digitization in many ways. On October the 7th, which is the 8th in Japan, we will be hosting an event with Jetro about how to adapt to the new national security review law for foreign investments in US technology companies. We have many more uh, coming up in October and uh, rest of the year. So please look for uh, information uh, in, in your email box that are coming to you. We'll be sp uh, sending an event survey uh, shortly. So please take a moment, please take a moment to respond. This is a very simple short survey. We appreciate your response, which may be already in the chat box, uh, the ac to access to this survey. With that, I'd like to close today's event. Thank you again, Martin and his team Thank you. for your wonderful presentation and talks and also everyone for joining us uh, today. But as, as Steve has said, and Martin has kindly agreed, uh, we will uh, continue this session open for Is anyone who man, wants man, to no, stay on no, 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 the additional 10, 15 minutes <laughs> so that you can ask additional questions more in, in the informal uh, setting. So please feel free to stay online if you wish. Otherwise, I hope you will have a wonderful uh, evening or wonderful day for those in Japan or whatever, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining and see you. We will, we will continue to um, explore um, an opportunity for Martin and his team to come to the Northern California, San Francisco and to share again, to see his performance uh live uh in the near future thank you very much everyone thank you thank you